Welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to episode 78 of the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch. And today, you get to hear a second episode by my friend and fabulous jazz guitar historian educator, Jackson Evans. Jackson agreed to record the history of the guitar as a guest lecture for my Introduction to Rock and Roll class. And I figured, A, it's really interesting. B, we're nearing the time of road tripping to go see family and friends for Thanksgiving or for holidays or for getting out of town for New Year's events. So I wanted to upload this episode so you could save it or download it and have it for when you're on that road trip. Y'all, there is so many interesting tidbits in the history of the guitar. And I know that my students also really enjoyed this lecture, so I'm hoping you will too. Speaking of enjoying things in the season of Thanksgiving, I'm very thankful for you, and I hope that you can take a second and rate and review the podcast. It's how we get the podcast into other people's ears and get more people listening and knowing that they too matter in this world of music ed that we live in. This episode is brought to you by our friends at the Kennison Choral Company, but mostly it's brought to you by friendship and collaboration and the power of music. I present to you now, Jackson Evans and the history of the guitar. Hello, folks, and welcome to a very special lecture. We are hosting a guest in this lecture. I went and visited a local guitar legend, Jackson Evans, and in this lecture, he walks you through the entire history of the guitar. Where did it come, where did it come from? How did it get involved in rock and roll? And how can you follow the progress still today as guitar and guitar technology continue to develop? I'm really excited to introduce you to Jackson. I strongly recommend following him on social media. He works at Benedetto Guitars, which is a boutique guitar. Anyway, I'm giving away too much. Without further ado, this very special lecture that I curated for you with Jackson Evans and the history of guitar. We are live in the living room of Jackson Evans. Tune in guitars. We tune because we care. Oh, aren't we glad we did it? My mother always said I was sharp. Look how sharp I am now. Okay. Today, we have a special guest on the lecture. I'm special. You are very special. This is Jackson Evans, and we're talking about the history of guitars. Absolutely. I know a lot about guitars because I'm a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> You're not just a nerd, which I think is a really cool thing. Can you give us a little bit, who is Jackson Evans? Where did you come from? What do you do? Gotcha. I am a professional jazz guitarist in Savannah, Georgia. I have been here since 2004. I taught privately and in community settings for 10 years um, before I had an opportunity to perform in China for two years. And uh, when I got back from there, my gig schedule took off. And so I have been performing professionally ever since then, almost exclusively. And in 2017, I got the day gig dream offer to be the sales customer service guy at Benedetto Guitars. As I was just telling her, it's not really a job. I just talk about guitars, which is what I'm here to do. Which is I get paid to do that during the day too. <laughs> so much fun. Jackson is by far the best musician in town. We're in Savannah, Georgia. Oh, and you're going to no, make me blush. I'm so serious. And his wife, Maggie, plays a mean bass. So we'll have to have her talk at some point in the future. But Tell us about guitars. So this is a history of rock and roll class. So right. what do they need to know about guitars? History of rock and roll. There's nothing more rock and roll than a guitar. When you think of rock and roll, the guitar is the central figure. So uh, let's find out where that came from. It goes all the way back to Africa. Did really? You know that? Well, I knew banjos have African roots. Absolutely. Same same basic idea. So okay. um, the oud, the al oud, um, the predecessors of the Via Huela, okay. um, all came from Northern Africa and they made their way over to Spain and Italy, uh, and became the first fretted instruments, which includes the, uh, violin, viola, um, all the, the string family instruments have their roots in plucked string oh. instruments. So even all of our orchestra instruments that are bowed. Yes. Originally were plucked plucked. first and also had frets that were, they were, they're kind of neat. They had, uh, 
instead of, I don't know if you guys know, but a violin doesn't have frets. You have to know where to put your finger. Mm -hmm. Guitars have frets, so you just put your finger kind of close and the fret is what makes the sound. That's a whole other discussion. <laughs> but the early violins had a uh, gut tied around where the frets would be. Ooh. So on the back of the neck, you had this rough surface to deal with. And you can, see why, you can see why they left it alone. Ooh, the tied guts. Right. <laughs> where does the lute fall into that? The lute is the next generation. So it okay. makes its way to Europe. Um, the lute, which was kind of teardrop shaped, um, it had 10 strings okay. or courses as it's called in lute terminology, mm -hmm. 10 courses. Um, it's a clunky kind of instrument, uh, big bulbous round back, looked like a gourd. Mm -hmm. um, it's the predecessor of the guitar. From okay. there, we get to Spain. This is where things start to get guitaristic. Okay. The Spanish, uh, a romantic people uh, wanted an instrument that was shaped like a woman. That's actually where the shape came from. <laughs> the curve. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, really. The uh, um, They shape. didn't like the big chunkiness of the gourd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the tear, the giant teardrop. <laughs> um, you got me. Uh, that's that's this this is coming from. Um, I forget the name of the book. Um, it was an out of print book when I was in college, but my professor got the rights. And so I had a, I have a photocopied version of this okay. book in my mom's basement somewhere. That's amazing. Um, and that's what the book says. So I'll I take their it. word for it. It's Go there's, it. there's citations in the back. Um, <laughs> but, uh, what I think is important there is the Spanish guitar is still a, a bit of terminology that we use today. Okay. Um, and, and it's essentially what we think of as the classical guitar. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't have an example of a classical guitar. That's okay. So classical guitar um, is the typical folk guitar that you're used to seeing today. Um, looks like the guitar I'm about to show you, but it's a little larger. Um, but the important distinction is it has nylon strings these mm -hmm. days. Formerly, it had catgut strings, um, which are Ooh. softer than steel strings. Okay. Um, so, uh, and the necks tend to be wider. Um, these are the guitars that a, a classical concert uh guitarist would perform in a big hall on. Mm -hmm. um, famous, the most famous name is uh, Rodriguez guitars um, made in Spain to this day. They've been building those guitars for what, 200 years, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, the Americas are coming up now. Okay, so we've so, gone from Northern Africa with all those different um, iterations to the lute. And then we have the Spanish guitar designed to look like a woman, which is still humorous. <laughs> yes, right. And we get to the Americas. We get to the Americas. Um, and Appalachian music is coming up. Um, early roots and blues music is happening. Um, 1880s, 18, 1860 to 1880, mm -hmm. uh, big pop music. Uh, the who's a I'm so oh, I'm so tons of mainstream. Who, yeah, who's a mainstream artist uh, right now? You, right now, right now. Oh, I don't know. I'm a terrible person. Billie Eilish. Billie Eilish. I love Look at Billie me. Eilish. I did one. Yeah, you did. I, even, <laughs> I actually so burned that record out. It's I love it. Um, the Billie Eilish of 1860 was like John Philip Sousa. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So big, loud brass instruments. Um, uh, European classical music was, that was the big hit yeah, music of the day. The guitar is this quiet little instrument that uh, after you go to your concert at the performance hall, the right. symphony hall, you come back, uh, you hang out with your friends in a parlor and they can pull out their guitar or play mm -hmm. a little piano and, and entertain each other with that. I have an example of that guitar. This is so cool. This is... Mm -hmm an 1880s Washburn. So this guitar is uh, 150 years old almost, 100 and 140 years old. I'm terrible at math. I'm not a math I'm, I'm a musician, I can count to four. Six. So Sometimes this... six, 11, 12, 14. Oh yeah, right, right, good job. I do quite. I'm a jazz musician, so I do seven. Oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so this guitar, uh, it came to me as a, it was a donation to a not-for-profit that I'm on the board for. Um, they pulled me aside and said, check out this guitar someone donated. I saw the beautiful back that has a uh, Brazilian rosewood. And I said, please don't give this to a sixth grader. Oh I took it back to Ben and I made a donation in kind, took it back to Benedetto. All the guys in the back fought over who got to restore it. Did some research. I was thinking it was from the 1920s. They built this model all the way up into the 1920s. Um, but it turns out it's from the somewhere between 1886 and 1892. The interesting thing about this guitar is it has metal steel strings on it. Okay. 
The steel strings were first put on a guitar by C.F. Martin. If you're a mm. guitar person, you've heard of Martin guitars uh, still in existence today. Uh, Chris Martin is a good friend of my friend Howard at Benedetto. Um, he's about to retire and he doesn't have any kids. So the, the, the last Martin to run Martin is, uh, wow. is about to, the I empire is changing. Sad or, wow, it, wow. Is, it, it is a little sad to see the end of an empire like that. Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, Martin were the main competitors for Washburn. Washburn, uh, this was actually made by uh, Lion and Healy. If, uh, if you have any harp players out there, mm-hmm. almost everyone who plays a harp plays a Lion and Healy harp. So that mm-hmm. company still exists. Wow. Their flagship line were the Washburn guitars. Uh, Washburn was the middle name of either Lion or Healy. I don't remember which one. Oh, um, so that's they, a cool name anyway. Yeah, and, and Washburn still exists as a brand. Um, Many of these brands have been bought and sold. Mm-hmm. They've been Asian American. Uh, every 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 business centric country has owned them at some point. Um, but in their origins, this is what they looked like. Um, in competition with Martin, they decided to also put steel strings on their guitar. Okay. Now, the purpose of the steel strings is to make the guitar louder and more projective. So before we were talking about how the pop music of the day were concert halls Mm -hmm. with acoustic instruments that were loud enough to project Mm -hmm. the guitar couldn't be heard so in order to make the guitar an instrument that people took seriously people were trying to find ways to make it louder and more projected so you could play it places besides at home Mm -hmm. um put it on the concert stage that's what makes it serious yeah exactly um and it seemed to work the guitar got more and more popular going into the the 20th century 20th century right Mm -hmm. 20 1900s yes, the 20th, 20th century. century yes math math, math. numbers <laughs> um so just to give you a, a little bit of what this this is going to sound like an acoustic guitar that you know and love you've heard before i'll be a little spanish about it roots. <laughs> So that is basically, we call this a flat top acoustic guitar. Uh, You've heard them, you've seen them, some of you might play them. Uh, The reason it's called flat top is because the top is flat. Um, The next type of guitar that came along in the history of the guitar is the arch top guitar. It turns out that this guitar is fundamentally flawed in its construction. I don't know. I didn't design it. Because it's trying to look like a woman. All right. <laughs> well, that's, that's this this profile. This profile is uh, the, the function of any string instrument. String vibrates, right? It goes up and down. It's connected to a bridge, which vibrates, and it makes this top vibrate. I'm wondering if I have my toy that's maybe hit it. Uh, you've seen those little... Um, uh, music box things. Yes. If they're outside of the music box, you can really demonstrate this well because um, this functions like the music box vibrating against the soundboard, which is the top of the guitar. So the top of the guitar is made of spruce. It's very light. It vibrates really easily. It's very stiff. And the whole and top is the soundboard. The whole board. top is the soundboard. So when that string, if I, if I took this bridge off and kept the string at the same tension and plucked it, you would hardly be able to hear it. But because that bridge is moving this top back and forth, it makes the air move and sends it back against the back. It reflects and comes out the top. So we just had an acoustics lesson that science, science. All right. Okay. Science. We're being scientists. That's that's why you have your glasses on. I should have worn my glasses too. We can be scientists. Um, Sound pressure waves. We're creating sound pressure waves. Um, The problem with this guitar is that the way a string is made to vibrate is pulled tight. This bridge is glued to the top. So for that hundred and some odd years that we were talking about, this these tensions have been pulling at that top. And you can see, you guys oh, might be able to see if yeah. I hold it up, the top has warped over time. Uh-huh. Um, and that bridge, when I got it restored, this actually isn't even the original bridge. They had to recreate it with a CNC machine. Um, they scanned it and recreated it exactly. Um, but then they had to shave the underside to meet that contour because it's been pulling itself apart. Oh. Um, that also that means, design flaw. yes, it is a design flaw. Uh, it also means that this piece of spruce can't be as thin as you want it to be. Okay. It has to be fairly robust. And then underneath here, there's a bunch of bracing that also keeps it from falling apart. Okay. Um, and all of those things restrict vibration. So Changes the more, design. if you listen, if I, if I put my hand, 
Yeah, the volume drop as soon as oh, I put yeah. the hand on it. Do a better job with this. It just mutes it right up, right? So anytime you add mass to that soundboard, you're going to restrict the vibration. Um, so people started to experiment with ways to get even more volume and more projection. Mm -hmm. The guy who came up with that is a guy named Orville Gibson. Oh, so we're, we're going through the, uh, the royalty names of, of uh, Guitar. guitars. We've talked about Martin, and now we're going to talk about Gibson. Orville Gibson thought, okay, I'm an engineer. Uh, if this guitar is pulling itself apart, maybe we can find a, a better shape and structure of the top that's stronger so that I can carve the top thinner. And that is the arch, right? You, you build a bridge, you have arches. If you have a flat bridge it can crumble and, right. or it has to have those heavy pilings, which would represent the bracing in this analogy um, mm -hmm. that restrict the vibration. Um, but an arch bridge only has to be supported in two points because it directs the pressures off to either side. So he starts carving guitars, but he's still gluing the bridge to the top. He has an employee by the name of Lloyd Lohr. And in 1921, Lloyd Lohr presents to him the L5, the L is for L. So the arch top guitar next year will be 100 years old. Wow. 1922. Excuse okay. Me, it's 21 now. So yeah, 1922 is the 100th anniversary of the arch top guitar. And Lloyd Lawrence says, congratulations, you've invented a violin. It's a, it's a cello. It's the same thing we've been doing since the 1500s, only you've brought it back to a guitar form. Right. Um, he said, as long as we're doing that, why don't we put a violin style tailpiece on it? A bridge that is instead held in place by the pressure of the strings. And uh, then we'll be able to carve that top thinner. We can have much less bracing and it'll be louder and more projective. So not attached with a glued on bridge. Yes. Yeah. So instead of being glued right here, what we've done, this, this neck is angled a little bit here. Mm -hmm. The strings now are attached to this tail piece, which is connected to the end of the instrument. So nothing's getting pulled. So nothing's getting pulled. Instead, the pressures are going down towards the guitar instead of pulling up from the guitar. So you've not only created a stronger structure that allows the guitar to be carved thinner, braced lighter, and therefore vibrate more freely, you've changed the direction of the forces, which is a is more mechanically efficient. Ooh. Now, this particular guitar that I have to show you as an example, has been compromised. Why? We put a pickup in it, which I'll oh. come back to that. So it's not going to be as loud as that last guitar was, but in, in their purest form, these guitars are very, very loud. Uh, they, they, they project, they go straight out to the audience. If you ever hear uh, Freddie Green with the Count Basie Orchestra, mm -hmm. he does this kind of playing. You can hear him chunking away like that mm -hmm. through a big band, which is four trombones, four trumpets, six saxophones, and he's not bass, drums, piano. Connected? And he's not amplified at all. So is that why people like Bob Dylan were able to still have a career before plugging in? Yes, exactly. Music was quieter back then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But this acoustics of this, it also makes sense why the hole doesn't have to be in the dead center. It can be on the outside because it's the whole thing vibrating. Right, exactly. Okay. And the size of these holes does make a difference. Okay. Um, the, the master luthier at uh, Benedetto came in one day. One of, one of the buffing guys had caught one of these guitars on the buffing wheel and a big chunk had ripped out. Um, and he built it out anyway, put the strings on, and he said, this is a great chance to demonstrate that the surface area makes a difference. So he played the strings like that and then took the piece off and it was the same effect as when I put my hand on the other guitar. It just got twice as loud because of the surface area. Wow. So, so it becomes when you're a builder, you have to get into this design process where you're going back and forth on what the, what the perfect size sound hole is without losing surface area to drive the amount of air that you need for the acoustic response. Wow. These guys are engineers. Yeah, they are. It's pretty incredible. Um, the problem with those instruments, you, you heard how I was using as a, as a rhythm instrument, right? They're very percussive and that sound goes forward. But if you start playing single note lines, if you know how loud a trumpet is, you're not going to hear that mm -mm. compared to the trumpet. Right. So uh, this guy, Charlie Christian, who is in Benny Goodman's band, um, he got into, they snuck, some musicians heard him play. They knew he was amazing. They snuck him into a rehearsal of Benny Goodman's band. And out from behind the bleachers comes this brilliant solo. That's my worst impersonation of, of 
of, uh, of uh, Charlie Christian. Um, he was sort of the first guy to start playing single notes electrically. And the reason he could do that, the reason he was heard from behind the bleachers is that he had a magnetic pickup installed on his guitar. Okay, now that's what you and have. That's what I have. So this, this pickup, is it's a magnet. Okay, what is it magnetizing to? So, nothing. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you how this works. Uh, actually, it's, there's a really cool analogy, or not an analogy, there's a, 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 an equivalent that you deal with every day. Okay. When you drive up to a stoplight mm -hmm. and you see the big, the, the two ovals carved in the hole mm -hmm. or in the, on the road, mm -hmm. that's the, uh, the trigger that allows the light to change. It knows there's a car there. Right. That is a humbucking pickup. Just like that. Just like that. So what, what's in there are um, coils of copper. Okay. And so your car, which is made of ferrous material, comes on top. And it interferes with the magnetic field of those in, inductive magnets that are underneath there and sends an electronic signal to the, to the light. And it says, car here, go green. Oh, wow. So same thing is happening here. You have a magnetic field. And if you wiggle metal in an magnetic field, it creates electricity. So we have this, this magnet that's connected, got wires connecting it to the, the jack where you plug the thing in. I have metallic strings here. Mm -hmm. They vibrate. That induces current. And... Yeah. And, and it comes out into the amplifier. The amplifier drives the speaker and you get amplified sound. So was the magnet how Bob Dylan plugged in the first time? It is. I just assumed he put down his acoustic and picked up an electric. I hadn't even thought of that. He, he did, but that's what made the sound. Wow. And we'll, we'll get to his guitar in a little bit too. So um, this is where we start heading towards rock and roll, right? Mm -hmm. um, what year are we in at this point? So we're, we're in the 30s. Okay, so... 1860-ish, we have the guitar. It's made it over through a whole yes. bunch of different things. It's mostly for popular music, entertainment. Correct. Um, although my favorite book, I think, is from the 1700s, A Gentleman's Guide to Being a Gentleman. It was written in the Renaissance period, and it talks about how you should practice so much that when you play in front of people, no one knows that you're working. That's how you <laughs> awesome. become a noble gentleman, just by the way. I'm, I might be close to being a gentleman someday. <laughs> <laughs> you are definitely <laughs> on that track. <laughs> um, so... They were part of that whole entertainment in the parlor being gentlemen and ladies. And then we became, that was flat. We got the arch. And what do we call this again? The tailpiece. The tailpiece. Uh, like a violin style tailpiece. And, and this was after 20, I'm sorry to ask, 21. 22. 22 was when this all happened. Yes. So 20, 1922, uh, Orville Gibson had made some prototypes before then, but it really took shape as, as what we know as the arch top guitar in 1922. Jazz age. Hello. Oh, yeah. So we don't just call these arch top guitars sometimes they're referred to as jazz guitars because of the arch and the yep and be, because they were the popular piece of, of equipment for the jazz age of course, um, the 20s. that's you don't have to play jazz music on on an arch top guitar um okay. maybell carter she mm -hmm. played a, an l5 uh, arch top guitar um, okay that's uh june carter's mm -hmm. mom uh, who was married to johnny cash None of you are old enough to know it. But they know all these names by now in class if I've done a good job as a teacher. Not <laughs> good. Yeah, it's, it's on the test. <laughs> so um, uh, you don't have to play jazz, but most jazz guitarists use this type of guitar because it was the popular instrument during the jazz age. Okay. Um, on to our next big name. Okay. Les Paul. And what year are we looking we're, at? We're in, up into the 40s. Okay. So music. They've seen Les Paul in the textbook. Yeah, they have. Mm hmm but not about guitars, which is why it drives me crazy. And I'm really glad we're having this conversation. Oh, what, what does it say in the Just about text? the band, just the, about like um, his performance career. Oh, it only mentions his performance. It just career. like has like one line about the, the guitars. It's like no details. Interesting. So Les Paul was, um, I mean, he had a, a show with Mary Ford, his wife um, for, for years on tele, one of the early television shows. So that also gives you some context for what America is doing at this point, right? Mm -hmm. um, you've got television is new, um, mm -hmm. you know, late 40s, early 50s. Uh, Family, this husband, is, wife. Yeah, this is post-World War II. Um, the, the greatest generation is flourishing. Mm -hmm. um, baby boomers uh, are, are the, the children of the World War II veterans are, are being born in, in big numbers. Mm -hmm. So um, um, we're economically... Uh, on the verge of, of big cultural change. Mm -hmm. um, Les Paul uh, <laughs> starts playing louder and doing these uh, 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 TV shows and, and needing a more versatile instrument. So um, Les Paul was more than just a musician. He was an inventor. 
um, responsible for a lot of recording technology too. I don't know if you knew this. Um, I he that. he uh, um, invented uh, tape uh, delay. Um, there's there's a, a replica of his of his workshop in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and, and all many of his inventions are in there. Um, okay. um, was instrumental in getting stu- uh, stereo recording going, and uh, he was he was a genius. Yes. But one of the issues with these guitars is, as I mentioned, we spent so much time making these uh, vibrate more freely, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, then we put a pickup in them, and we point a speaker at it, and what happens when you point a microphone at a speaker? feedback right you get a feedback cycle and it starts screeching and wailing Les Paul is playing in these settings where he's asked to be a soloist in front of a big horn band and playing really loud and he's having feedback issues Mm -mm. so his solution was he took an archtop guitar a beautiful old Gibson to a bandsaw he cut the wings off so he made two cuts right down here and then he got a fence post and replaced the middle of the guitar with a four by four fence post, mounted the guitar back, looked awful. So we glued the wings back on to make it look just like this guitar with, but with a, a four by four down the middle. It was called the log. The log. The log. And it is not, it's arguable the first uh, solid body electric guitar. Okay. Um, it's, it's one of the early attempts. Other people have made attempts at, at that concept too, but, um, but he did it in a very applicable way. He found that he had a need. He, mm-hmm found a solution for the need. So the pickup then, instead of being over a vibrating acoustic top is in solid wood, which has no acoustic sound whatsoever because it's just dense. It can't vibrate at all. Right. Solve the problem. So Uh, folks at Gibson Guitars are like, oh, Les, (laughs) we need to talk because clearly you're interested in developing this. Um, But I'm going to put that story on hold because some other people in California beat him to it. Really? Yes fellow by the name of Leo Fender in oh. 1948 okay. was busy developing his own electric guitar. So I have an example of what that. Sweet. So it was almost, okay. This is the same period of time that we're also having the format wars in the recording industry with like, um, not recording, but the record industry. So they're having the format wars between the LPs and the seven inch single or five inch singles. And yes. Singles. So it's all the, all these different because people have, were smart and had time post war. Right, right. So tons of innovation going on in the in the in the recording industry yes. at this time. Um, like as I mentioned, stereo recording was was new in the forties. Mm-hmm. Um, when you get into the fifties and sixties, you had Esquivel working in quadraphonic recording, and, and people are just going crazy with ideas because they have time and money to to right. make it happen. Uh, Leo Fender. Um, surfer guy out in California wants yeah. to make a, a loud guitar. One of his early buddies, if you're familiar with Dick Dale, mm-hmm. um, Dick Dale was was one of the he aided in the development of the of the solid body electric guitar. This is a Telecaster. It's not a Fender Telecaster. It's um, one that's made by Damon from Benedetto. But mm-hmm. but this is the body shape. This was the the first slab style electric guitar. Um, was this body shape? Um, the first ones were were originally called broadcasters. Okay. Um, but the Gretsch company made a drum set called the Broadcaster and sued oh. them. Oh. So the most probably some of the most valuable guitars on the vintage market are the no casters. So there's a, a one year period of time, one or two years, I can't remember. The, there's I have to be careful because there are guys who can there are guys out there that can be like that's not an original case. They had they had blue handles that year. Whoa. There are people who go really deep into this history stuff, and I just this like this is an intro overview class. We yes. got you. We got you. Yes. So. Um, uh, for those couple of years, they were the no casters. So they had no logo on them. They had no name. Uh, they eventually, early television, arrived at the Telecaster when they <laughs> added a second pickup. So there was two pickups. Okay. Um, it's a it's a chunk of wood with magnets screwed to it. And what's on, like, how is that just paint? Like a special That's type just paint, of paint? Yep. Um, so this color was a, an iconic fender color from the 60s. It's mm-hmm. called surf green mm-hmm. um, from when surf was, was surf music was, was surf, really big. I was going to ask, are you, do, do you have any splatter platters? And they like the, cause surf became splatter platters, right? Splatter platters. Splat- splatter platters. After splatter platters. Oh. The, the, um, after the surf music, started to morph and they were trying to get a little bit more dark. There was all these stories of car deaths and they started writing songs. The surfers started writing songs of death. And so those records are called splatter platters because oh. all the songs were about death. 
Wow. But it came okay. out of the surf. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. Random and Sin Platter genres. references the record. I yes. Presume. Yes. Yes. That's very Sorry. cool. No, but that's yes, great. I say surfers and I just go right to where surf music kind right. of ended. The, the dark end of surf Sorry. music. Sorry. <laughs> you might not know that by now when you're listening yeah. to this. I hope I didn't ruin it. Yeah. So surf music is kind of really happy most of the it time. It is. It um, is. But more importantly, um, a few years later, so, th- so this is 1948 when mm-hmm. the Telecaster comes out. Um, Leo Fender starts experimenting with another body shape in 1952. He comes out with the Stratocaster, okay. which is hands down the most iconic body design it's it's in every genre of rock and roll mm-hmm. remember rock and roll hasn't been invented yet mm-hmm. 19 1950 40, yeah 1940s and, and there's there's hints of it um bill haley's about to happen mm-hmm. um buddy holly mm-hmm. plays a stratocaster <laughs> you, you know there. it you, you know it my so, favorites are all these early rockers right so mm-hmm. buddy holly plays a uh, a stratocaster now the arch tops are still hanging around scotty moore and elvis's band yeah he's playing an arch top Um, Oh yeah. Bill Haley played an arch top. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people going backwards, but a lot of people think of arch tops as a sub genre of electric guitar because they only know the rock and roll perspective of them. But now you know more than that. Now you know that they were acoustic guitars first. Um, But yeah, electric guitars are when things start getting really, really loud. So here's some cool stuff. So we're still in the forties, Yes. but we're not yet to like rock and roll doesn't have a start year. I mean, a lot of textbooks say it's a 55, 56, whatever. 50s right but all these instruments existed already but they weren't in rock bands um they were more solo artists where who these were these them? instruments were ended up being in rock bands because they don't have the full sound so you need you need uh, um an accompanist okay more to the point they are inexpensive as i mentioned they are a chunk of wood with magnets screwed to them <laughs> so uh an arch top is hand carved by an artisan like Bob Benedetto, or at the right. time it would have been James D'Angelico or uh, John D'Angelico in New York was, is sort of the, the Stradivarius of, of arch top guitars. Stradivarius is a very, very famous violin maker, okay. if you didn't know. Yes. Take intro to music. Right. <laughs> uh, these are cheap. So all of a sudden, every kid who has an interest in, in music, um, People in uh, less affluent parts of of society have access to a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. Um, Not only is it uh, uh, an instrument that they have access to, it's an instrument that um, simple music can be played on quickly without a lot of instruction. Yes. So don't have to pay for a lot of lessons Mm -hmm. or or any for that Mm -hmm. matter to get to get a start. I always joke that guitar is the easiest instrument to learn and the hardest instrument to master. Oh yes, I agree. So it's very, very polar. You can you can be playing your favorite Beatles tune your first day and um, it'll take you decades to if your calluses come in uh, (laughs) or it takes decades to master. Wow. Um, so yes, blues artists are using uh, a lot of the um, the Mississippi guys because they're traveling and they need a more durable instrument that's affordable. Uh, they start using electric guitars. Okay. Um, the sounds and experimentation are suddenly available. Um, if you go back into the twenties uh, and get into music concrete and mm-hmm. and all the there's electronics are influencing music. Electricity is basically new at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, homes have only been illuminated for what, 40 years at that point. Um, And and speakers and radios and, and all of those, um, all of those things are going to interact with the different guitars differently. Mm -hmm. Um, At some point, and it's debatable where or when somebody thought that um, the guitar sounded better if the speaker was broken really and the world is gifted distortion (laughs) (laughs) just like grunge music everything sounds better if it's tuned down just a smidge yeah exactly just a little bit darker a little bit a little bit uh a little bit more aggressive so blues guys are are probably who are responsible for for distortion and they probably didn't mean to use it they they were probably they were using radios or cheap amplifiers that um when you got in the juke joint and the place got jumping you had to turn up and when you turn a speaker up that far it starts to overdrive and get that crunchy sound Uh, and that became the thing and that became the thing and then as happened through much of rock and roll uh those sounds were being copied by the kids who wanted to play like what they heard on the records. Mm -hmm. So 
as rock and roll develops, distortion and, uh, and new sounds start coming out. And because of that, more so now than ever, um, we get into to foot pedals. Right. That I was just going to say, so where did foot pedals? Because you've said so many things that we've read about how mm-hmm. it's all about what you're hearing on the radio, that rock and roll is the merge of rhythm and blues, country, Western, and pop music. Right. And because we were hearing it, because there were records and radio stations and more cars and more TVs, we were hearing those sounds, which is where rock and roll came from. Right. And the more they heard, the more genres, and it just becomes a splintering of genres. Right. And eventually you have engineers that are trying to find better ways to make those noises happen. Right. So um, I don't know who invented it, but the fuzz pedal comes along. Okay. It was around, the fuzz face was the original one. It was a round pedal with a button on it. You plugged your guitar into that, that got plugged into the amplifier. And when you stepped on it and engaged a circuit, that made it sound fuzzy. Cool. The first ever recording of the with the fuzz pedal can't get no satisfaction, the Stones. So if you need a reference of what a great Stones. fuzz pedal sounds, yeah. We have a debate in class when we're not virtual on what is your favorite British band? And then they have to guess which one mine is. Uh, we, we won't say it out loud. They might not know yet. Okay, all right, they might not know yet. I did see the Stones last year no, in Jacksonville. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. That's amazing. It was amazing. Um, since the 50s and 60s so if we move forward in rock and roll Mm -hmm. i don't know where are you guys in the class you're you're so i'm so impressed that you know where you are in the class and it's like this was six months ago (laughs) um i start doing um guests like special topic lectures towards the second half of the semester so i know we've probably made it through um the first british invasion and they're probably right at the beginning of what we call the growing rock monster which is the 70s okay and then it splinters from there so they're probably somewhere in the 60s to 70s gotcha so this is this is 60s and 70s is the pinnacle of guitar technology um Mm -hmm. you've got it really hasn't developed that much since um pedals and synths and things Mm -hmm. have have come along but but in terms of um and and this is the important part that i want to want to emphasize now vintage instruments the instruments of that era um a no caster or a, a a 58 less paul are, are they go at auction for millions of dollars because you want to play on the original because you want to play on the original and they have the tone that maybe doesn't exist in the instruments that are made today because, because of the con- technologies have changed because the technologies have changed and people have, have cut corners in the way that they build the instruments mm-hmm. so one nerdy guitar bit of minutia a nitrocellulose finish nitrocellulose finish so cars used to be painted paint finished the the master finisher at benedetto does not like the word paint cars <laughs> used to be finished with nitrocellulose lacquer nitrocellulose lacquer is a uh, a natural substance secreted by the lac bug in india um, added to solvents to um, create uh, a paint-like material that can be sprayed um, or infused with color and sprayed as paint but do you know it was also in the first records Yes. And that's why we then became vinyl because you couldn't get the lac. Right. And the lacquer is, well, it's a natural material Mm -hmm. Um, besides being caustic with all the, you know, it's terrible for your health. Um, It's, it's, it's inconsistent. Natural materials aren't consistent. So um, from a manufacturing perspective, Mm -hmm. if you're, if you're Leo Fender in 1948, you're making 150, 200 guitars a year, which is a lot. Right. In 1958, this, this blows up, and you're making tens of thousands of instruments. You and and if your lacquer system shuts down every three days, right, you're screwed. Plus, there were wars, and a lot of the lac bugs were coming from Korea and those type of places, and so there was a scarcity in some points too. That was a big reason. Yeah, that that yeah, I believe I'm that. That's probably that more World War World War Two. Mm, I think. So. I don't know that it became an issue with guitars, but no. It, but the la- that's what ha- that was the main shift in the material for records. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. Because it was originally like um, cotton and rock and lacquer. For the mu- for the musical instruments, it was plastics coming along. Ah, You've seen uh, uh, vinyl plastics. The Graduate. Yes. Um, one word: plastics. Yes. You know, plastics are are a huge. Um, a huge change in, in American culture, even mm-hmm. I would say Tupperware exists at the end yes. of the fifties, you know, uh, so you can store food in different ways. And, but that also means that lacquer, which is a pain to deal with gets replaced in heavy manufacturing settings with polyurethane. So what is yours made out of? This one is finished with nitrocellulose lacquer, um, the old school way. Um, the difference is 
that it goes on much, much thinner. Okay. Um, part of the trouble of applying it is it goes on microscopically rough. So you have to go through a process of building it up. You spray one layer and you sand down the peaks, fill in the, the valleys with another layer and you have to, there's a back and forth. So okay. at Benedetto, we sprayed 12 layers of lacquer and the thickness of probably um, three or four is what's left. And the rest of that has been sanded off by hand. So, so massively time consuming. Mm -hmm. Polyurethane goes on perfectly smooth, but thick. Okay. So acoustically speaking, we're That's choking out good. the wood. Yeah. And even on a solid body guitar, I, I joke around and say it's a slab of wood with magnets screwed to it, but it, a, it, it, the wood still affects the sound. Mm -hmm. There's still a vibrance in there that will make its way to the amplifier. Um, so our, our uh, master finisher at Benedetto is um, a, a huge rock and roll and blues guy. Um, he has, has taken uh, modern fenders that were finished with polyurethane sanded them down, refinished them the old way mm. with nitrocellulose lacquer. And it's a noticeable difference in the sustain and the overtones and the richness of the, of the tone that you get from it. That's so cool. So that's why there's the drive towards wanting old instruments. Exactly. Um, the real nail in the coffin is the, is the corporate changeover. Mm -hmm. um, the, the date is 1968. Um, CBS Corporation bought Fender. Um, okay. and, and went into mass marketing mode and sacrificed quality over quantity. Um, it's all been retooled over the years and bought mm -hmm. and sold. And, and, uh, you know, Fender has a custom shop, uh, Gibson has a custom shop. Um, all, all, all of the major brands have also been supplemented by hundreds, if not thousands of much smaller builders, um, companies like Benedetto that are totally quality focused, but there's, mm -hmm. there's a, um, a vacuum through the seventies and eighties where this was a still being figured out. Uh, wow. so instruments went through some wild changes. Um, they stayed roughly static in that they were the same base of, you know, the Stratocaster, the Telecaster and the Les Paul body shape, mm -hmm. um, the SG, which stands for Spanish guitar, by the okay. way, that's the, the pointy Gibson. That's the, the, probably the lesser of the known body shapes. They sort of became the standards, but, um, with, uh, glam rock and metal mm -hmm. and and all double the double necks. Yeah, double necks and and um the the artistry of it um got replaced with the with the marketing value mm -hmm. as as the music industry blew up and found its its new modern voice mm -hmm. that's amazing so that's the history of the guitar that's that's that. how it ended up in rock and roll and that's uh that's that was amazing. This is such a good, I have, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you for yeah. saying. Well, I hope you all have enjoyed it too. It's a, uh, um, it's a passion for me and um, I, you know, don't let the synth bands kill the guitar. If they want to find out more, can they follow Benedetto on social media? Yep. or Benedetto guitars. We're on Instagram. We don't do a ton with that. Um, Facebook, we do daily posts. Um, our website, benedettoguitars.com. We do daily posts. Um, Benedetto is, is just the arch top guitars. We focus on building, um, you know, the best jazz guitars in the world. Um, if you want to learn more about the guitar in general, hit the internet, go to YouTube. There are experts that have dedicated their whole lives who are more than happy to put their, um, their detailed instrument knowledge out there. Uh, Norman's Rare Guitars comes to mind for great content. They're a, a vintage shop in California. They put tons of stuff out. It's lots of famous people stopping by to play their guitars. Um, Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top has an amazing collection. Joe mm -hmm. Bonamassa, the blues guitarist, has probably most of the expensive guitars in the world at this point. <laughs> he has a huge collection. Um, so but if you look up those names, you'll find pictures of guitars that look like they've been in an attic and are probably worth $500,000. Amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I am dying to hear what you learned in this episode, the history of the guitar with my friend Jackson Evans. Remember, you can always reach me over at patreon.com slash musicedmatters. It's the best place to go if you want to support the show or join the conversation. And I would love to hear what questions and what things you learned from this, because I bet if we get enough people, we could get Jackson back on. Maybe we do a podcast with like Jackson and Maggie playing their music together because man, they play such good jams. Oh, anyway, maybe that's an idea for teacher PD weekend next year. I digress. 
I'm really obsessed with rock and roll right now, and I hope that you've learned something today in the history of the guitar. It's fun to look at the roots of what we call our world of music. Maybe this has inspired you to try something new or look a new direction, whatever it is. You, my friend, you matter. We all know that music matters, especially the guitar and especially rock and roll. And I'll see you next time on the Music Ed Matters podcast.